He's essentially he hired Kenji in part so that Kenji can wear his colors at the Pro Tour. Kenji's the best. Kenji's pretty awesome. Yeah. He's good times. <laughs> good times. All right. It looks like we're ready to go down to the feature match. So uh, Randy Bueller with Jacob Van Lunen, and uh, we'll be right back. Hello and welcome back to Grand Prix Cincinnati. I'm Jacob Van Lunen. I'm being joined by Randy Bueller. Uh, we're about to watch a feature match of Tamaharo Saito against Josh McLean. Uh, two very powerful wizards. Josh McLean, one of the better uh, players over the last year in the Grand Prix circuit, and Tamaharo Saito, uh, an old standby. So uh, on the play, Josh McLean with Temple of Deceit there. He's going to scry. He's playing a uh, Esper deck, card for card, the same as Alex Haynes' deck. And uh, Tamaru Sayoto on the other side of the table is playing a Bant Control deck, which is essentially Azorius Control, just splashing for Kior, the Crashing Wave, and some sideboard cards. Yeah, fundamentally, these are both Sphinx's Revelation decks. Yes. The core of their decks are blue-white. Sphinx's Revelation, Supreme Verdict, Detention Sphere. I mean, they're basically blue-white decks. But, especially in an environment full of all the, the Scry lands, you get to splash a third color. It's interesting that they've gone in different directions for that splash. Saito has gone to green, basically for Kiara and a couple of sideboard cards. What's he got, like Skylasher and uh, Celestia um, his, Charm? Yeah, Skylasher, Celestia Charm, and Heroes Reunion, which is... is really? Yeah. That's so, just gain seven life? Just gain mana? seven. I mean, like, wow. when you're playing against Red, White, Burn, when you think no, about it, no, it's I, better than a two-for-one, right? I, you know, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I just haven't seen it before. Yeah, Tamaru Saito, has a, he's, he's a deck builder. I mean, he's yes. definitely built a lot of decks over the years that have won a lot of tournaments for a lot of different players. So, yeah, Heroes Reunion. It's the kind of card that, like, random random dude doesn't show up with Heroes Reunion <laughs> in a sideboard, right? He'd be way too embarrassed. I'm just going to play two mana gain seven. Tamaru Saito can show up with Heroes Reunion. Everybody goes, oh, yeah. Nice. That seems perfect against the bird <laughs> decks, right? Actually, uh... Looking at these two deck lists, it looks like both of them are pretty prepared to fight a uh, Revelation War. Tamaru Saito has eight counter spells in his main deck. Okay. Eight. He has four syncopates and four dissolves. Wow. Where, all main. Yeah, all main. And Josh McLean has a main deck negate yep. to go with his four dissolves and two syncopates. So they've both got a lot of counter magic. I'm interested to see how this plays out. It's going to be a true control mirror. I mean, yeah, I mean people, both people playing lands. They both have one Aetherling. McLean has one Aetherling, three Elspeth. Yes, and uh, the game with. Saito also has uh, one Aetherling and two Elspeth. And two Kiora. And two Kiora, yes. Which Got can it. win with nine nines. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Release the Kraken. Now, one of the most important things we're going to watch here is who misses their land drop first. Definitely. That's definitely one of the most important parts about the Control Mirror. And uh, you often hear people talk about how Control Mirrors are these really skill-intensive battles. But in this day and age, with Revelation being as important as it is, and with a lot of the counter magic being pay X or lose the spell, uh, hitting each of those land drops as you go up the curve is going to be super important in order to win that counter war over the important spell. Yeah, I mean, the, the idea is... Your opponent can pick a counter fight during your end step. So yep. if, you, if you're forced to tap out, defend off like a rev for five or something super powerful, your opponent gets to untap and drop Aetherling. Like a resolved Aetherling is game over. Yes. Now each guy only has one Aetherling, but you have to constantly live in fear of the fact that your opponent might be holding it. And if you ever tap out, your opponent goes to a main phase while you're not representing a multiple counter spells, Aetherling just ends the game if it resolves. So we see both players just playing lands, and uh, it's normally what you want to be doing when you're playing one of these yeah, control matchups. Yeah, the other thing is, if you run out of lands, now you're forced to either start casting spells or you're going to have to discard them. Yes. It's the other reason why you want to just keep making land drops, making land drops. McLean goes with the Beta Islands. Ooh, very nice. Saito's just on Zendikar. Guy owns a card shop. He can't do better. I mean, I like the Zendikar <laughs> Islands, but... I mean, he needs to keep those Beta ones in stock, right? Oh, okay. I guess so. There are no Japanese beta ones. Right. Well, although, to be fair, the <laughs> Japanese fourth edition look like beta. It's the That's same true. art. They're black bordered. Like, McLean could be playing Japanese fourth edition, and I wouldn't. I, w I don't know that I can tell the difference <laughs> from this far away. I may or may not have a giant pile of fourth edition basics. J Chinese that Japanese. Mark Pool Island. Yeah. And neither yeah, player like, missed a land drop yet. Yeah. Yes. 
I was just going to say, Saito does own a card shop. We were talking about this during the break. He uh, trades for cards. So traveling to international shows for him is partially just business. He wants to get, all, get cards to take back to the shop. And he, he's also he's a guy who clearly loves magic. Absolutely loves magic. You often see him playing in Grand Prix trials. This right. guy who always has three buys. When you win a trial, you get two buys. So he, it's not like he's playing for anything. Right. He's just doing it because he wants to play magic, and he can't find people to play standard against the night before. <laughs> Actually, uh, a couple of years ago in uh, at a Grand Prix that was limited, I played against him the, in a sealed grinder the okay. night before the Grand Prix in the finals. And I was like, why are you playing in this? You're doing three buys. Do you want to scoop? And he's like, no, no, I'm not going to scoop. And then he beat me. <laughs> ah, Kiora the Crashing Wave coming down for Saito. Uh, picks the first fight. And, I mean, when you don't have that land to play, you've got to pick that first fight. So Stop let's see today. how... See how Josh deals with it. I mean, with Josh will have to deal with it. Oh, definitely. He's going to, you know, syncopate for five or dissolve, maybe a negate. There Sync will for be five some. would allow him to leave up dissolve mana, so that's not that scary. Oh, interesting. He allows it to resolve. That surprises me. Surprises I mean, me he, also. He may be holding a D sphere, figuring, all right, but I mean. Saito goes down with Kiora. I keep expecting him to go up and try to make Krakens. He goes down a lot to draw the extra card. I'm not even sure he has a land to play. Yeah, he didn't before he drew that card. Right. Taps out for Jace. Wow, that seems huh. risky. That does Do seem risky. Do you have your Aetherling, Josh McLean? Well, he's going to go looking for, for it. Four. Is it in the top five cards of his deck or in his hand? Wow, Saito just tapping out. Saying, yeah. I've already done it. I've got Kiora. You're kind of going to have to deal with Kiora. It's basically a gambit saying, if you haven't drawn your Aetherling yet. See, but even Elspeth could be a problem here. Yes. Yeah, I don't know about that tap out for Jace there. Then again, I mean, if he only has Syncopate as a counterspell in his hand, then... He's not really going to be able to interact in his Your opponent's turn anyway. Know but that. That's true. No, that's you true. play enough blue decks, you realize just untapped islands yeah. are scary. Yeah. Like, you don't have to have it. You just have to represent it. I mean, McLean hadn't cast a single spell in nine turns. Like, just untapped land was clearly scary enough. McLean does not appear to have his Aetherling. All he, go, all he resolves here is a Jace. I mean, it's not nothing. There's the Aetherling. Uh, has he played a land this turn? I don't think he would tap out for it anyway, especially now, not main deck. Yeah. You need to you need to have a mana to blink it. I mean, at this point, you know, if he just taps out for it, then he could just get hit by a Supreme Verdict. There are so many cards that sphere. could. Yeah, yeah he, he yeah. would not tap out for it. I think I mean, Elspeth Minus would even kill it. Okay. You know, it's, there's a, right. a wealth of options. All right, he is willing to tap out for Elspeth, though. That's what I... You're not worried about Saito having an Aetherling? I, there's only one in the deck. I feel like there's... Maybe you're so far ahead as Josh in that spot that you don't need to, but... I don't know. I, I think so far ahead, aren't you... Like, that's why I don't want to tap out. I want to stay yeah, far. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Elspeth yeah. has a lot of value. I will give him that. I like that tap out for Elspeth better than the tap out for Jace. It, it applies pressure to the opposing Kiora. Exactly. It looks like Saito does have his Aetherling. Interesting. Yeah, Kiora's not going to survive those tokens, so Saito draws another card. Kiora was effectively a divination. I don't think he used the extra land drop. All right. McLean tapped out. Saito resolves an Aetherling. Yeah, and Maybe suddenly... that's why he tapped out. He's like, if I tap out, then my opponent will to say, oh, here's my window, i got to resolve something. And as long as he doesn't have an Aetherling, I get to resolve mine. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think that was Saito's thought there. He plays on a pretty high level, so I wouldn't be surprised if that was his... Uh... Yeah, I like Saito's line a lot better now that I realize he was building up to an Aetherling. Still scary, but... Oh, cool. All right, so he's leaving the Syncopate with the Revelation. Because he doesn't want to give his opponent a dissolve. Yeah. The hard counters are super powerful in this matchup. I mean, it's not like, you know, back in the day where these decks would have 20 counter spells in them. Wow, and he takes the dissolve. Super nice split there from wow. Tamahara. Yeah.
And yeah, McLean has the Aetherling we saw from before. He's going to play it. Saito's representing it, Dissolve. <laughs> Untapped land. Pay through life. Got to defend this Aetherling. Resolves. Yeah, well, the thing is, is that he knows that uh, Josh already has a Dissolve in hand because he just gave it to him. Yeah. With the Jace. And uh, also, I mean, if he does cast that Dissolve, then he. If Josh happens to have, you know, like Syncopate. Uh, I mean, then if he counters it and wins the counter war over the Aetherling, then Josh can just minus his Elspeth and kill the opposing oh, Aetherling. Oh, sure. Because he'll be tapped out. Fine point, yeah. He can't, yeah. he can't tap out with Elspeth in play. You're right. But now Saito, he's going to kill Elspeth. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. He's going to blink Aetherling. <laughs> yeah, has to kill all the tokens. Supreme Verdict <laughs> wipes out the tokens. Both the El both the Aetherlings, of course, dodge Supreme Verdict. Josh is winning this race. Right. I was thinking initially El Saito going to get to attack first, but the t between the tokens and the Elspeth, that advantage didn't help. Wasn't enough to win him the race. McLean's also the one who got to revel rev for, what was it, five? Yeah, I think it was uh, Revelation for four. And then uh, McLean has drawn so many extra cards here. Right. And what is that? Uh, what is that card there? Is that Faded Retribution? Yes. Alongside Elspeth and Azorius Charm. Yeah, the McLean Hain list plays one uh, one main deck, Faded Retribution. I like that. An extra way For to what it's worth, by the way. You know, the designer that I have heard given the credit for the, the Hain blue-white that he won Vancouver with, that basically what he and McLean are playing here, is Tamahara Saito. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they started Not necessarily Saito's surprising. Blue -white. <laughs> Saito has now gone over to the, the green side rather than the black side, but... All right, so Josh likely going to attack with the Aetherling. I mean... If he wants to win this race, that's going to be the plan. I'm just going to go ahead and pump this Aetherling up a bit. Wow, Josh's hand, just so much gas there. Mm -hmm. Multiple revelations. I mean, at this point, they're not even that relevant. I mean, they're relevant in the sense that they can break serve the Aetherling going back and forth, but if you try a revelation for a lot of mana, you're definitely just going to get, you know, you're just going to run into a syncopate or a dissipate at this point. Is this just a game of Saito blinked first? First guy to cast a spell loses. It looks like first it. First guy to cast a main phase spell anyway. And it was the first spell of the game was that main phase Kiora that Saito led with. I mean, he managed to get his Aetherling out, but by tapping out, gave McLean a window for a free Sphinx's Revelation. Now McLean's up a bunch of land and a bunch of cards and has Aetherling advantage. Yeah. I mean, here, it's, uh, it's interesting. I mean, there are no... Uh there are no Azorius charms in Saito's list, so he can't like pick a pick a fight right now with any spell that has like an efficient cost or anything like that. He's just gonna have to take the damage. So what's Saito playing for? Well, it looks like he's gonna go for a revelation here. Okay, so rev for one, two, three, four. Yeah. With four mana to defend it. Post board, uh, Saito does have a couple dispel, which are going to be really strong here. Sure. Josh only has one dispel post board. And Josh lets the rev resolve. It's actually a shockingly reasonable play in this matchup. So few yeah. of the cards matter, and those you know those hard counters, those dissolves are so precious that it's like yeah, draw four, gain four. That's not the most devastating thing that you're going to do. So I'll just hold on to this dissolve. See, Jace comes down. 
Is Josh going to fight over this? No. Nope. And Josh has decided that he's only going to fight over cards that affect the board right now. Yep. I mean, he has an Aetherling in play. He's winning the fight right now. There's no reason for him to be countering spells. He's got plenty of mana in play. But I mean, what it, Does Saito have something to dig for? I feel like Aetherling is just the game here, right? Is well, he, I mean, if he's able to gain enough life, he can actually man? win the race, possibly. So I assume he's just going to attack um, before making an unblockable. Force Josh to actually activate the Muta Vault if he wants to tangle. And Josh is not going to bother. Yeah. He's going to activate it for two. Now, uh, you're seeing these A-throwing activations and probably wondering why these people are... Uh, you know, pumping it for the amounts they are pumping it for. Uh, Josh, the reason he d he attacked for six twice is because that leaves Tamaharo at eight, uh, thus putting him in range to die to the next day throwing attack while keeping his mana as open as possible. Uh, Saito here putting Josh to 16, so that's two attacks from the Aether Lang, assuming Josh didn't have the revelation, which he did have. All right, so uh, a Sphinx's revelation for two here from Josh McLean. Picks up a Dissolve from Saito. Uh, a rev for four. But oh, Rev for four. I'm sorry. Uh, dissolve so and Dissolve back. Yeah, it's been uh, double Dissolve. Now, does Saito have uh, another Counterspell here? He could pay three mana and actually deal with this, but then he's likely to lose his Aetherling. So he's just mm. going to allow it to Resolve. Discard a Last Breath. It's a crazy world we live in where our opponents, you know, have the mana to counter our draw four, gain four, <laughs> and have eight cards in their hand and choose to let it resolve. <laughs> but Aetherling is a very powerful card. Uh, activating a Muta Vault, Josh McLean now has ten points of power in play. Josh also with a nice insurance policy if Tamaharo does somehow uh, gain enough life to uh, oh, alright, so last breath from Tamaharo. Josh going to jump all the way back up to 24 now. <laughs> alright, so I mean, I really don't know this. what... Oh, it gets into eighth. I guess that's good enough. Yeah, uh, deals four. It's like eight, I can get in one hit. That'll be good enough. For now, I'd like to leave all my mana untapped. Interesting. So he blinks out his Aetherling, points a D-Sphere at Saito's Aetherling, and then responds with an instant speed Faded Retribution. Killing Saito's Aetherling. Very nice play there. Yeah. Aetherling comes back into play there for uh, Josh. Still With has the mana to blanket. Mana available to blanket, yep. And uh, now that it's in play, he has that mana to blank. It, still, no actual uh, answer for Saito here. It's a oh. gigantic rev. rev. Well, that's a very, very big Sphinx revelation. Uh, it looks like. Eleven Two handfuls. Yeah, eleven cards. Saito's now gonna have to discard. I mean, he just tapped out main phase. So. Yeah. I mean, you do what you got to do. I just I don't oh, know definitely. how. He, I mean, yeah. I don't know how he know. wins though. Yeah, I mean, I guess it has to involve get resolving an Elspeth or a Kiara, and then somehow gaining enough life to live long enough to ultimate one of them. It's got to be some some line like that. It just does not look like there's anything here in his deck that can deal with the Resolved Aetherling. So it looks like Saito went to 16, so it must have only been 8 cards? Or maybe he played a land untapped? 16 is different than 17, is why I bring this yes, up. Yes, yes, 16 is very different from 17. It's a whole turn. 
Uh, I mean, six. All right. Saito taps out, so McLean resolves a Jace. He's going to pick up a couple land. Aetherling, four pumps. That would make sense. lethal next turn. And that's one of the most important parts about playing Magic success successfully is figuring out that math, that series of turns, how much damage you're going to deal on this turn and then the next turn and then the next turn, and just figuring out what you're, w the bare minimum that you need to kill your opponent so that you can use all of your mana efficiently and uh, protect yourself as much as possible in playing a match like this. Saito attempting to kill Jace with Mutal Vault, but there's Last Breath. This is going to give Saito another turn, yep. but McLean would rather keep his Jace. Replacement Mutal Vault. Although it is, you know, a question of whether or not you Last Breath there, because your opponent is I an know. 8. I agree. You know, you, you can just kill them with an Aetherling next turn. I, I hear you. So uh, that Jace revealing a Syncopate, uh, an Elspeth, and... Uh, didn't quite see the last card there. That Aetherling comes back down. Likely coming in for another eight here. Dissolve Supreme Verdict Detention Sphere. And the Dissolve goes right into the hand of Josh McLean. Again, we've talked at length about how that's one of the absolute best cards for this match. Yeah, with Saito at 12, McLean is content to hit him for six. And take out a Jace. The Detention Sphere. Moving J Jace from the game. We have Tamara Saito down to six now. Is that Haferling finally going to get the job done? Seems Looks likely. Looks like it is. <laughs> Rev, no, no, no. Scoop him up. And that's it. So game one goes to Josh McLean, currently the 16th ranked player in the world. Yeah, part of this real resurgence of Canadian magic with around team face-to-face -face games. Now, McLean is American. Oh, we just had the back table match end as well. Jeff won. Wow. It's Alexander Haynes' undefeated streak may end. See the teammates here with the card-for-card uh, -card mirrors, McLean and Hain, both playing the same blue-white just a touch of black in the sideboard control deck. I did a video already. McLean and Hain, two of the top 25 players in the world right now. Jacob Wilson also on their team and sitting in the top 25. Sam Pardee, not ranked, but has been putting up good results sort of solidly on the gravy train as a, as a gold level pro. Yeah, Josh and Sam, uh, kind of the two... Uh, the two flagship players of the pod deck that has been so dominant in modern. Just been winning everything. I don't everything. think you can list the flagship pod players without Andrew Cunio. I may be biased. That's fair. That's fair. I was a teammate of Cunio's back in the 90s, but I feel like he's been playing pod longer than anybody. And putting up, I mean, he doesn't have the Grand Prix wins that these guys have. So maybe yeah, not I quite mean, the he came in second place in Lincoln, right? And, he, deck, and he's top yeah. 16 to the most recent PT, or top 20. I think he was 20, approximately 20th. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. He's done very well at every, every tournament where he's right. gotten to play that deck. Right, right. No, but I, you're right. Among the flagship players. Yes. Josh <laughs> and Sam. Three big weapons. Josh and Sam are the, the big people on Magic Online who started playing the deck and just winning every event on Magic Online, whereas Cuneo is the guy who just built the deck and then started beating everybody with it. <laughs> but you're right. He is the, uh, he's definitely the original Maliripod master. Right. Yeah, the modern pod deck has definitely had a lot to do with the success of face-to-face uh, -face games. Both McLean and Pardee and Jacob Wilson have picked up a lot of their pro points piloting that deck. I mean, everybody was gunning for it at the PT, too. I mean, it's like there was 
a lot of pod players who lost, but it's like the ones who'd been playing it forever. Those three guys, Cuneo, I mean, all four of them, I think, wound up top 25-ish. It's deck that if you can play it well, it will I, I mean, reward I think, you. I think it might be the most difficult deck to pilot in Modern. There are so many lines. I mean, you've got a deck which is all one-ofs and tutors. Yeah. There are, you have There's the a lot of play to that. <laughs> right. I mean, you have to decide what you want to have the ability to do coming into the match, right? You've got to decide, you know, do I want access to an Aethersworn Cannonist for the Storm matchup? Do I want access to an Orzhov Pontiff? Like, there's all these sort of individual decisions, you know. Is it worth it to have the two-card infinite combo of Archangel of Thun plus Spike Feeder? Like, so many different decisions just getting down to the 75. And then you've got to say, okay, now that I've got these 75, what can I actually do with them? Just, they're more different lines of play in that deck than maybe any deck I've ever played. What do you think of the Archangel combo? Do you think it's worth it? I do. I do also. I mean, yeah, it, I'm a big fan. Maybe I just, I'm not good enough. I need training wheels. I don't think it's training wheels, though. I mean, the Archangel also makes your Kitchen Finks just, you know, come back indefinitely. Yeah, kitchen Finks is an overrun, right? Yeah, it, uh... It, your Kitchen Finks, you cast it, you you know gain a life, you get plus plus one, then you sacrifice it. It works like a Malira with right. your Kitchen Finks, even. Right. So, it's, uh... It's definitely a powerful combo. Also, it's just, it's a Baneslayer Angel. You know, it's a giant flying lifelinker. If your opponent can't deal with it, it can win the game by itself. Yeah, you don't need to be comboing them. The face-to-face -face guys have been going back and forth on Twitter with LSV. It's been kind of fun to watch. <laughs> LSV did run the Archangel combo at Richmond when LSV top aided with the pod deck. Uh, and those guys still, still don't think it's worth it. They still think it's a little clunky. I mean, a lot of fine-tuning a pod list is also, what do I do in the games where I don't have pod? You know, having another infinite combo that you can tutor up isn't, isn't the way to make the deck better. I mean, the, the case against the Archangel combo is just like, how do I maximize the power level of my deck in games where I don't draw Birthing Pod? The games where I do draw Birthing Pod are the easy ones. So what about the games where I don't draw Birthing Pod? You know, like, Spike Feeder does not measure up against the modern creatures. <laughs> That's true. You don't really want a Grey Ogre. All right, so just playing some lands here. We have uh, Tamar Howe and Josh McLean leading on Temple of Enlightenment. Then uh, Tamar Howe has a Hallowed Fountain to follow that up. Josh with a Muta Vault. We're going to watch both these players play lands for a little while. Oh, well, a Bermaz from Pretty Tamar much Psycho. every controlled deck I have seen all weekend. If it's game two, they're summoning giant monsters. Maybe it's Night Vale Spectre. Maybe it's Bermaz. It's usually Archangel. It's funny. So we were to the point where we watched a matchup between... Uh, Esper Control and Boros Burn. The Boros Burn player, game two, had both Chain to the Rocks and Faded Conflagration still in his deck. <laughs> and used them. Nice. They took out, it was like, Night Veil Spectre. Oh, Chain to the Rocks. Oh, Archangel, Faded Conflagration. What is happening? You're supposed to put that stuff in your sideboard for game two. What do you mean? Every Esper player on. has creatures after sideboarding. <laughs> I feel like I, you bring in more. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that Archangel, you can't deal with that when you're a burn deck. No, it's sir. It's game over. So Bermaz is dealt with via Detention Sphere. Detention Sphere is really one of the format-defining cards of Standard right now. Definitely. Repeatedly seeing that in the uh, feature match area. All right, a land untapped there for Tamaharo, and uh, he's going to go for a revelation for two. Must be out of land. Yeah, and I mean, when when you don't have a land to play, and you're playing Control Mirror, yes. that's something you absolutely need to do. So, uh, you plays Temple of uh, Plenty there. Gets to put just one card, not plenty of cards, on the bottom of his deck there. So I see on our side monitor that the back table appears to be empty, and that can't be good news for Alexander Hain. No. We heard that Jeff Pika was up a game. I'll try to get a confirmation. Uh, given how quickly that ended, Pika. Who, Pika? Yeah, so Jeff Pika has, in fact, Ooh. defeated Alexander Hain. And that's a good matchup Last, for Alex, too. I would think so. I mean, it's blue devotion against control, right? Yeah. Blue Devotion against Supreme Verdict. It doesn't seem verdict. like the detention spheres are super relevant in that matchup. I mean, the splash, I mean, Afar is probably pretty good in that matchup. Afar yes. seems spectacular, actually. Afar seems very, very good. <laughs> if you can resolve it. 
So yeah, last man standing, only 12 and 0, Jeffrey Pika. Blue, Blue devotion, devotion with the white splash. Pretty impressive. Temple of Silence there. Uh, continue this scrying and passing back and forth. And another Sphinx's revelation here for Tamahara Saito. This time for three. Is Josh going to let this resolve? I don't think he will. And if he can counter and still leave up counter magic, then yeah. It looks like he can. I like playing these aggressive, small little Sphinx revelations when I'm playing this matchup because yeah. you're just working toward that one big turn. I think once the dust settles after there's the first battle, mm -hmm. the what happens after that is pretty inconsequential in most cases. Yeah. Saito, I think I saw a peak of uh, Aetherling in Saito's hand. I mean, I think a lot of what he's doing here is trying to run McLean out of counters. Like, he tested the waters with a rev for two. He, you know, rev for three did get out and negate. I mean, if Saito, I don't know how he's doing for land in hand, but... This is not good news for him. I mean, I feel like he's been tapping out for these things. Whereas, I mean, ideally, you'd lead with something like an Elspeth and then be able to fight a counter war. You know, maybe you win the counter war, maybe you don't. But really, you're just trying to deplete your opponent of resources so that you can eventually resolve that Aetherling. Yeah, but here, I mean, he got Josh to tap out. You know, Josh went for that Sphinx's revelation during his main phase because oh, right. he had the opportunity. Phase. Yeah, got it, got it. Yeah, I mean, Josh so, yeah, only had Saito four, can four mana. Plop an Aetherling on the table here. And now he gets to start applying. Right? Oh, definitely. No land, but yeah. Saito ran out of land, which is why he had to start the fight now, and it basically worked. And we saw his aggressive tap-out strategy not quite work out in game one, but this game... It's, it looks a lot different. I mean, he probably has the spell mana open also, in addition to having mana open What's for... he got, one in the sideboard or something like no, that? No, he's two. Two? Yeah. So he's drawing a bunch of cards. I feel like if he had Dispel, though, he would have dispelled that, revel that Rev. That's fair. Yeah, yeah. Two, he has the other out. two revelations. He drew all four copies of Sphinx's revelation. <laughs> That's also a good reason to just use them Must for two and nice. three. <laughs> now, what does McLean take with his Thoughtsees? Fiora, Rev, Rev, Detention Sphere. You take a Rev? Yeah, now he hopefully can counter the other one. Maybe sort of win the card advantage game. Oh, that Detention Sphere wasn't in his hand. That was the Detention Sphere in play. Right? It was Kiara Rev Rev. No, and, and D-Sphere. And D-Sphere? Okay. okay. Oh, yeah, you're right. He has three cards in hand. All right, so. So, yeah, McLean takes the Detention Sphere. He's got to deal with Elspeth. And then he's got to somehow figure out what he's going to do about Aetherling. So it looks like he's going to go ahead and get Elspeth off the table here with that Detention Sphere. This does, does mean that McLean has tapped out main phase again. Saito can untap and that has his choice of Rev for four or Kiara. Oh, is that an additional thought sees? No. And I don't think he needs to do that much. I mean, he, he's definitely going to no. kill the Jace. But well, it sent two tokens to kill Jace. That denies McLean, a you know, a card. Yeah, and also like makes the tokens relevant again. Oh right. You know, it makes it so that Josh actually has to use a card to deal with those tokens. Yeah, McLean has seen enough. He's not getting out of this. I like, think he can deal with. He dealt with the Elspeth. He's still got to deal with the tokens. He's got to dealing with Aetherling is almost impossible. We did see McLean kill one in game one, but the only reason he was able to do that is that his own Aetherling was applying so much pressure that Saito was forced to tap down to one mana, where you know an Aetherling answer followed up by an instant speed Aetherling answer. He yeah. got one instant speed Aetherling answer in his list. Yeah, because he was able to get his opponent down to one remaining mana, that meant that he was able to deal with Aetherling using 10 mana worth of spells. Right. And, you and know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, this game, not Saito's under no pressure. Yeah, I, McLean, I think, completely correct. Scoop him up, try to find time to win game three. There are about 14 minutes left in the round clock. Um, yeah, you know, these guys often have a small time extension because we sort of get people moved over to the feature match area. Um, not a lot of time for game three, but we've seen games end faster. 
Yeah, I mean, it's pretty impressive that these two have made it into game three with, you know, 14 minutes on the clock when they started a little bit after being yeah. the feature I mean, match they area. Both, they were both long Aetherling games, too. I don't know how long that one was, but... Yeah, neither player wants a draw. The draw, possibly lethal. Like, you pick up a draw here, win out, you could easily miss top rate on tiebreakers. Definitely. Also, for Saito, I mean, he picks up a draw. He's he's not qualified for the Pro Tour. Right, right. XN2 always qualifies for the Pro Tour if, if you have a big Grand Prix. I guess it just always does. XN2, well, yeah. it's, it's, gonna make, it's either going to make the top eight or it's going to qualify. Some, the yeah. small GPs only have four slots. You might have to play a one-slot qualifier if you top eight on X2. But uh, this Grand Prix, well over the 1,200-person mark to get eight spots instead of four. The uh, Saito yeah. slap. Oh, yeah. Where he hits himself in the face before game three. Very familiar to anyone who's watched him over the course of his Pro Tour career. He tapped out against me at uh, Worlds one year during the extended portion and uh, let me cord for Victor, like cast a cord of calling that yep. was lethal because I got a mirror entity and he immediately recognized what he did as soon as he tapped out like before I, when I started tapping my mana oh okay and he just started slapping himself in the face repeatedly wow <laughs> he beat me anyway yeah <laughs> yeah you want to games? yeah <laughs> no I, I feel like he genuinely believes that slap helps him keep his brain sharp he means it when he slaps himself too not for show. It is. It is for. <laughs> he wants it's to for punishment. It. <laughs> Josh ran out of five cards here. It looks like. Oh my. Yeah. So that does not bode well for him. And then again, uh, mulliganing in general uh, in this match at this point is dangerous for both these players because it yeah. takes time out of the clock. Oh sure. And that's very valuable if you want to be able to win this game. Alexander Haynes still sitting now at uh, he was uh, eleven and one now. Yes, not a bad record. And make it through these last few rounds. It almost feels like he's already in top eight. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that you could find someone to bet against him in being in this top uh. eight. All right, so uh, an Island from Josh here chose to play right. He did choose to play, so he's he's on the play with five cards here. It's only one more land in his hand. Scary. I mean, he won't have to discard for a little while. That's true. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Stops at two mana. Not going to attack with Mute He's going to leave up Syncopate instead. Well, it's summoning sick this turn, but... <laughs> no, not this, no. That, he just missed his third land drop. Oh, you're right. He did miss his third. All right. Still no third land. Ooh, and a Selesna charm. Oh, cute. His end step gets to start that aggression. And, I mean, when you're going into game three with, yeah, yeah. you know, ten minutes left on the clock and a control mirror, yeah. you know, sideboarding in that 2-2 two -two flash the, is yeah, pretty reasonable. Yeah, being able to summon a creature end step. <laughs> not irrelevant. Okay, he's just going to tap out for Kiora, which is going to get syncopated. McLean finally draws the third land. And now he has the dissolve. So he's you know, going to be able to put up a little bit of a fight. No way McLean's going to trade Mutavolt for that to creature. Oh, no, of course not. It's a very valuable third land oh, here. Oh, there's another one. Wow. Yeah, now I uh, don't you know. think this is a scenario many people saw coming. Yeah, Kamaharu Saito, ladies and gentlemen. The green splash for <laughs> Kiora and apparently Celestia Charm for yeah. the mirror. Just those flash bears, you know? <laughs> Uh, 
sometimes you just need to attack with the Mystic Snake. <laughs> Uh, vigilant Knight Tokens can stay on offense while also yeah. you know, protecting Planeswalkers. This is a two-turn clock. Like I mean, Josh yeah. does have to start thinking about trading a Mutavault. Mutavault for Mutavault? Sure. That makes sense. And that seems a little bit better than trading uh, otherwise because at least now, you know, if, if he can draw two white sources in a row, his Supreme Verdict doesn't just leave him dead to his oppose opponent's Mutavault. If he even has a Supreme Verdict. I mean, Detention Sphere is the more relevant card. Detention Definitely. Sphere will take out both tokens. I mean, I'm sure Saito is planning to just sit on permission. White Source finally entered play on McLean's side, so Saito's going to take half his life. Threatening lethal next turn. McLean is going to be forced to go for a D-Sphere here. And then just about any pair of counter spells from Saito will be good enough. Right. Yeah, so let's see. Does get to keep Mutavault, too, so he's not completely dead. Surely Saito has a counterspell for this D-Sphere. And uh, looks like it's a One, two, three, Syncopate. Four. Yeah, Syncopate. Okay. Syncopate resolves. Now that lonely Mutavault can trade with one of the Knights and buy Mc Josh McLean another turn. Saito sends them in. McLean's block is forced. McLean is tapped out on two, facing a knight token off the put a 2-2 two -two into play mode of Celestia Charm. Hit only four lands in play for McLean right now. Taps out for Elspeth. Yep. Ooh, and that's... Three tokens. That's going to be rough. This is rough. Josh McLean, I don't even know if he has Supreme Verdict in his deck after sideboarding in this matchup. That's what it would take here. And even then, the Elspeth... Scry, look, extend the hand. And that's it. And you know, wins, wins a game in this control mirror in less than five minutes. There's still seven minutes left yeah. in the round. Less than five Come minutes on. despite a, a double mulligan taking up some time. I mean, 